You're listening to the Fan to Fan Podcast, and on this episode, we're digging into Friday the 13th, Part 3, in 3D. Here we go. Welcome to the Fan to Fan Podcast. I'm one of your hosts, Bertie Gonzalez, joined by fellow co-host Pete Charbonneau, and we have a returning guest, Josh Spiegel. You may know Josh from his YouTube channel, Movie Timelines, with over 50,000 subscribers. Josh does deep dives into movie franchises that have multiple movies. Nightmare on Elm Street, the Halloween movies. He even tackles Stephen King adaptions, Christmas horror movies, John Carpenter films. Josh is also the author of the book, Timelines of Terror, The Fractured Continuities of Horror Film Sequels. It's published by McFarlane. And we're happy to have Josh back because we're talking about a movie in a storied horror franchise, Mount Rushmore, Friday the 13th. And specifically, we're digging into Friday the 13th Part 3 in 3D, released in 1982. And because I'm a fan of context, let's dig into 1982. So it's 1982. You're probably more likely not watching a Friday the 13th film. You're probably watching E.T., maybe Blade Runner, maybe Tron, 48 Hours, Conan the Barbarian, Fast Times at Ridgemont High, favorite of mine, Dark Crystal, that's overlooked. 1982, also a banner year for horror movies because you get The Thing, Halloween 3, Creepshow, Poltergeist, Slumber Party Massacre, but we also get Friday the 13th, Part 3, Released on a Friday, August 13th of 1982. Friday the 13th, part three in Super 3D. The all-new process that puts you in the picture. Whether you want to be there or not. It will scare you. Count on it. Friday the 13th, part three in Super 3D. Josh, we talked about the Friday the 13th movies. You're in a wood paneled basement somewhere watching these. Did you have your 3D glasses on? I've never seen part three in 3D. I would love to see part three in 3D. I'm actually kind of bummed because um, just the other day in Hollywood, they um, screened part three in 3D with uh, Larry Zerner was there who plays Shelly. And um, I didn't get to go see it. I was very, very sad about it. but. I play horror trivia with um, Larry Zerner. He's actually in one of the opposite, one of the opposing teams. He's oh. Shelly from Part Three. He's um, always there. He's very, he's very nice. He always gives us um, behind the scenes goodies. That is awesome, Pete. How about you? Do you remember the first time that you saw Friday the Thirteenth Part Three, or were you one of those kids in uh, in the theater uh, watching ET? Uh, yeah, I was definitely in the theater watching ET. Not so much Friday the Thirteenth Part Three. I was ten years old. And I don't recall being aware of this coming out in 82. Uh, I think it was right on the cusp of my kind of immersion in and discovery of like horror slasher movies. First time seeing it was almost certainly on cable a uh, short time after. I do remember, I had seen it already, but I do remember, and this again, this is early days of cable for you. I think I've told this story once or twice before, but my dad was an electrician on Long Island. And back in the day, he's like, he would come home every so often with like illegal cable boxes, like how he got his hands on them, <laughs> not really say. That's the statute but, of limitations, Pete. It's all good. <laughs> yeah. But this is like the days of like, it would be like this kind of flat box with like a little slider and you'd kind of just slide it up and down the channels. And uh, HBO was 23 and we had family night in the basement one night, me and my mom, uh, my dad and my brother and uh, watching Friday the 13th part three, which, you know, there are moments uh, with some nudity where like, I literally just felt like, you know, it was like a thousand degrees in that basement and I'm just, like, <laughs> sweating profusely. Just going back to like the, that time period, like my parents had no problem like sitting or even just my brother and I being in the basement watching something like that. But if they caught wind of us, like putting on something like Porky's, you know, you better believe they were at the top of the stairs, like get that off. I can't watch Porky's, <laughs> but by the 13th part three have the time of your life. So yeah, it was probably... 83 or so when I first saw this one. And as I mentioned uh, in our discussion, when we talked about the Friday the 13th series. Uh, this has always been uh, my sentimental favorite of the series. I just, you know, it's not it's not great by any stretch, but I love Richard Booker as Jason. You know, I, I just love the whole aspect. It still had that gritty feel of, the, of those first couple of Friday the 13th movies. 
Uh, although this one had, I think by this time, I think they had moved from filming on the East Coast to this was the first one shot in California, but it still felt like they were at or near Crystal Lake from the from the first two. So yeah, I I, I love part three. This one always felt to me like the movie that made Jason Jason. Besides, you know, the fact that he wasn't the killer in part one, again, spoilers for a movie that's certainly a few <laughs> decades old at this point. But I think this is the one where it's like, yeah, this is Jason. And this is even beyond the fact that this is the movie where he gets the iconic hockey mask. There's just something about the tone of this movie. And obviously, you know, we're going to talk about the fact that it's in 3D and it certainly leans into that trend, that gimmick. But I think this is where it's that scene, right? In Scream. Jesus Christ, you don't know the rules? Uh, have an aneurysm, why don't you? There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. For instance, number one, you can never have sex. <laughs> Big no no! Big no no! I'm a dead man. Even in pop culture, sex equals yes. death, okay? Number two, you can never drink or do drugs. <laughs> No, the sin factor. It's a sin. It's an extension of number one. And number three, never, ever, ever under any circumstances say, I'll be right back. Because you won't be back. I'm getting another beer. You want one? Yeah, sure. I'll be right back. Oh! You see, you push the laws and you end up dead. Okay, I'll see you in the kitchen with a knife. All of that stuff is there because Friday the 13th is like part of the DNA that established those tropes final girl and the stereotypical teenagers, the sex, the smoking pot. We all saw that in Friday the 13th. Sean Cunningham, directed by Steve Miner, like, we kind of know what this is and we know who this guy should be and we're going to lean into that. And then we just got more of that as the series progressed, for better or for worse. When you're looking at this franchise and you look at how it kind of goes, it's very clear that this is sort of the culmination of it. But, but the, what's weird is knowing that that wasn't ever planned. Like the hockey mask was not meant to be a permanent thing. Uh, strange when you think about this franchise in general and someone says Jason and the first thing you think of is him standing there in a hockey mask. He didn't even show up in the hockey mask until three quarters of the way through the mm. third movie. I mean, because first of all, they don't show him on screen for most of the movie. He's just in the hands kind of like a figure in the background. But the first time, you know, the first time you fully see him in that hockey mask, the movie's almost done. It, it's pretty crazy when you think about how long it took them to kind of like put him in that iconic look. And there he's showing up in this movie. And uh, part three has a certain vibe to it. But a lot of that is based upon the fact that they're throwing things in your face every thirty seconds. <laughs> yeah, it was. It wasn't planned, like you said. It was unintentional. And I was reading how I think it was a, a lighting kind of test where one of the folks on the set was a big hockey fan, had some hockey gear. Steve Miner's trying to figure something out. They pull out the mask to figure this out, and then I guess they see it. And they're like, "Oh yeah, no, we're we're, we're sticking with this. Like this is what Jason is going to look like moving forward." And kind of neat that there's like that kismet that made jason that iconic because before that yeah it's basically town that dreaded sundown jason mm. to hockey mask jason the the funny thing about that story is is that story apparently changes depending upon who's telling it because i guess oh, the, i have to imagine sure <laughs> the story of like how the hockey mask ended up in the movie there's so many different versions of it that i don't know i don't know which one is accurate I did see it was like a 1950s Detroit Red Wings hockey mask, and then they like vacuum formed it or something. It's definitely you, an old school one, yeah, yeah. I say even for that time period, that hockey mask was dated. So that that that's always interesting. And I think that's part of like the the fun of the movie magic and the lore of these things, right? Because none of this was planned, uh, and I'm sure all of these movies were planned to a certain extent. But like it just goes to show, like you know, you, you couldn't have mapped this out to work out any better than the happy accident that that resulted of them you know however the mask got on jason's uh face now it's movie history and you know and you know, you, you would think like oh yeah we planned this all along but no it just <laughs> it just that happened to be that day shooting they needed something and and there it was and the rest is history i'm gonna run with that one because you said happy accident maybe this is the most morbid of transitions ever because i want to talk about the cast <laughs> and we got to start talking about debbie who obviously must have had a happy accident because she's pregnant. And I did not catch that, I think, 80 times watching this film before. And it's not until this time they're like, holy shit, she's pregnant. I'm assuming that, you know, Andy's the dad. And he's down, like he's on board. 
that's yeah. in a way for the time a little bit progressive. Like you would norm not normally see something like that. You certainly wouldn't see like the the father be like on board and like you know they they have seems to by all accounts a committed loving relationship. So that was nice to see. He's so excited. He's on a handstand. I mean, he's coming apart at the seams. He's right. so he's excited. He's, it's such a weird moment because it's brought up and then it's never mentioned again. Yes. And, and I think it's literally just thrown in there to just kind of be like a little extra high risk of yes. like, oh, this girl's pregnant. They're not going to kill her. Right. Yep. That, they wouldn't do that. I'm not sure if it's that or if it was somebody said, well, you know, we got to do something to make these characters more likable and more like real <laughs> people and just real people. Well, real people get pregnant. What if she's pregnant? OK. And then they just wrote it in. And then that was it. And it is interesting that it never does play into the plot later. I don't know if it's to the detriment of the movie that it's not played up or if it's actually to the to the benefit of the movie that it's just kind of like a weird callous thing like Jason doesn't care why would he care in it's, some ways it maybe it would have been more callous cuz you know she kind of gets like the Kevin Bacon treatment as far as like mm-hmm. the way her kill happens but m- maybe there's at least some awareness in that machete not being to like her stomach or something really <laughs> morbid like that where you're just like all right whether it was just a throwaway or to your point Josh where and I do think that's why I think with this cast, they seem to be the most, to me, believable group of actors who are portraying people who are yeah. who could be friends. The fact that it becomes a throwaway is, you know, maybe that's that like Deborah Hill sprinkle in the Carpenter films where, you know, she's like, hey, John, like, just let them talk this way because this is how teenage girls talk. And John Carpenter be like, that's cool. I, I got a chain smoke anyway. And that perfectly is fine with me. Versus <laughs> this where it's like, oh, yeah, let's have her pregnant. Because like you said, yeah. Teenagers get pregnant and this happens. And then to your point, Pete, it's like, yeah, it's not Andy, the whole movie trying to talk her out of it. Or how are we going to do this? Or like, if anything, he's practicing his amazing yo-yo skills because he's going to pass that on to his kid. Like, that's what's happening. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I do think I do think what you said there, uh, because I I do I want to think that it was intentional, because the one thing I will say is. For a movie that has what is generally considered to be a bunch of generic teens out to a cabin to get killed off, part three does have some of the ones that you remember the most, and they kind of do have the more uh, uh, more character moments thrown in there. Obviously, I do think I think Shelley's one of the more memorable people. I think the fact that, that she's pregnant makes that a little bit more memorable. I think that having Shelley have that weird, uh, not Shelley, um, the final girl have that weird incident with jason when she was younger uh kind of i feel like Uh, chris yep yep chris there you go trying to have a little bit more detail into the people so they're not just generic kids you still have characters that are not crossing over into the annoying i hope these all these people get killed i feel like they're all genuinely generally likable enough you know you don't have even like when you get to part four and you know and teddy bear comes along you're like oh please please off this guy <laughs> please off the last american virgin um but uh but before we get to that like these are all you know generally likable characters the character development of course is spotty and not really there they're essentially there to be killed but th- there's nothing off-putting about them like yes shelly gets a little annoying but he's still i think there to represent maybe what they thought a, a certain segment of of their fans were like too like you know there's i think anyone that grew up myself included that felt like they were not part of the popular group just wanted to be just wanted to have some kind of group to call their own or just to be accepted he's kind of the avatar to that in a, in a certain way and they do have that one scene where he and i think it's vera go into town to go get some stuff. And that's, of course, they run afoul of the biker gang. And then, you know, there's the whole knocking the biker gang motorcycles over. And so even though she's not looking at him in a romantic way, like they still have like that bonding moment. And he, he feels like he's making a connection with someone that he probably thinks is way out of his league. But there's, you know, there's, there's, I'm not, I'm not trying to give this movie like any more credit than, than it, you know, that it needs. But there, there are still little moments there like that. Uh, that I appreciate that they're at least trying to insert into this to to attempt to make you care about the characters a bit more. 100%. Especially, I think, with Shelly being the kid, 
who would have been the kid like me that would be like, oh, Debbie's reading Fangoria. I like Fangoria. But yeah, especially with Vera, like that intro scene where she's having the argument in Spanish with her mom. And I'm like, oh, I've had that argument in Spanish with my mom in the past. Or like, I totally get it. And it's just like a quick little beat. She had an argument with mom. She's going to hang out with these kids. Uh, she meets Cheech and Chong in the back of the van. Like, you know, hey, it's it's a good time. <laughs> But even when she's she drops Shelly's uh, completely amazing Velcro wallet into, oh, into the yeah. lake Just and the you see the wallet. shot of like Shelly with his like maybe grandmother or mother in the picture. And she has that like moment. Yeah, I, I don't like like this guy in that way, but I'm not going to shoot him down completely. And even when he shoots his shot and be like, hey, maybe you like me. And she's like, yeah, I know. But, you know, you don't have to be this person. You have to be this annoying. And we should just talk. Maybe they'll be childhood friends, you know, except for the harpoon in the eye kind of thing. But besides <laughs> that, uh, like there's something about Vera that I was like, oh, yeah, she got a little short shrift. She was she was kind of cool for that little moment. Well, I feel like Vera, you know, probably could have used um, a, some prescription glasses because anyone that can see <laughs> Jason on the dock for Shelly at that moment, yeah, yeah. you have to question a little a couple of things about them. So I think you're discounting but- Shelly's. Uh, Richard Brooker like physique. <laughs> <laughs> hey, now cut that out right now. That's not funny. Plus, we get the bikers. I mean, at, at those guys, you know, oh, like, bikers were great. Yeah, yeah, easy like cannon fodder. They're gonna get killed, but then like for whatever reason, they layer like a little bit of dimension to them. They're badasses. Ali is amazing when he's got the the quick little smile, the chain. Like that's such a good scene. But then to have them later in the farm and they're kind of like, well, should we really be doing this? Like, they're just a bunch of stupid teenagers. Like, we were probably those kids just a few years ago. That scene always kind of sticks to me because like, yeah, the bad guys are not so bad. Even if you're a biker, you've got a, a little bit of humanity in you. And they showed that. The the moment when the the, the guy comes back in, near the ending and you're like, oh, he's still alive. I it, It's like, I don't want, like, I want to see him actually give Jason a bigger <laughs> fight. Yeah, come on, fight him, fight him. And he goes down really quickly. I don't know, I always love in movies when it's like you have that guy that you think is dead, but then they, they're just like, no, you can't kill me that easily. So it's right. like, that. <laughs> Rick's the one guy that like clearly has like no clue what Chris has experienced and like doesn't really seem, I mean, obviously he knows what she's experienced, but he doesn't really seem to care because like his his main goal is just like, well, I was going to take my shirt off, haul some hay bales, and hopefully you'll... uh you want to sleep with me? It's like oh, this woman's going through some trauma, buddy. Like why don't, why don't you why don't you ease off a little bit there? And he he just can't seem to do it until he gets his head squeezed a little bit. And that that's something too that noticing it again for the rewatch for this, we get Edna and Harold. That whole intro, I was like, man, this is dragging. But you know, if you're a teenager in 1982, you've got your glasses on. You know, they're literally throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the screen because you just saw these 3D titles. Oh, yeah, you're in the right theater. You're going to get some stuff lunged at you for the next 90 some minutes. <laughs> well, and as we talked about, Bernie, on some of the other 3D 80s movies that we've discussed, and we've discussed a lot at this point. <laughs> we have. Uh, <laughs> a lot of them, surprisingly, and we, we've opined on why this is, like maybe they weren't originally meant to be in 3D, but a lot of them don't lean into that Chuck stuff at the screen like this movie does. And I would argue the opening to coming at you does. Uh, (laughs) uh, But here you get it. You get the yo-yo on the screen. You get, yeah, you get the, the rat hanging on the the wooden board. Like, Oh, that's right. Eye popping, you know, popcorn coming out of the top on the stove. Like this was clearly, this was a a conscious choice. Believe Paramount developed their own special lenses for the 3d cameras for this so much so that I think it cost them even more money to kind of, you know, fit theaters to, to show this a certain way. They had to train, you know, the projectionists on how to show this properly. Paramount was putting money into this. And I think it made pretty good box office, certainly off of what the, what its budget was. But this was clearly done with 3D in mind, as as opposed to some of those other films that came along in the early 80s that might have been retrofit to to kind of jump on the craze. This one was was planned uh, as a marketing gimmick from the get-go. Yeah, they've even said, like, I think in, in the book, they talk about, like, uh, how difficult it was to film with the special cameras and how so much of the days would 
would uh, depend upon how many 3D setups that they had to do. They they all hated it. Uh, was it Worth Keeter who directed a few movies for Earl Owensby and Pete? That's a Earl Owensby was a he's name. Gotta, Josh, you always got to get Earl Owensby. Into I have the to. Podcast, yeah, Bernie. He's he's a guy that we discovered this year as we've been talking about all these 3D movies and you know like Metal Storm: The Destruction of Jared Sin, Space Hunter, Jaws 3D for sure, Amityville 3D that we talked with you, Josh, and Earl Owensby made Rottweiler, Dogs of Hell, Tales from uh, from the Third Dimension. Uh, Worth Keeter was one of the directors that worked with him on some of these films, and I guess uh, Sean Cunningham like was consulting with him because he Worth had shot so many films in 3D. That before they started shooting Friday the Thirteenth 3D, can you like help me out here because we want to make sure we don't lose a lot of time? And Worth Keeter was like, "Yeah, sure." Like you know, like show me the script that I can help you out. And I guess Sean Cunningham was like, "Are you, are you fucking nuts? Like we don't have a script. Like if we had a script, we'd be shooting today. Like like that's that's not how this works. I don't know how Earl runs it down south, but no, like that's not how this does it. But yeah, I read that too, Pete. Like I guess they use the same lenses or technology even for Jaws 3D as well. Hey, just kind of curious because I know you mentioned uh, Metal Storm. Uh, I'm assuming you did you did an episode. Yeah, you on... have to call it by its full name, Josh. Metal Storm. Yeah, Destruction. Well, I, I, guess, I, think, I, I guess I guess we'll discuss that because in in the movie Metal Storm, the destruction of Jared Sin, is there a Metal Storm? And and wait, because it's called the destruction. Of, does Jared Sin actually get destroyed? Very little, very little destruction of Jared Sin in that movie. That's right. You're you're right on the same page as us on that. Josh. Yeah, so, it's so That's right. To do that. Yeah, but you know what's really weird? Right now, at this very moment, if you want to, uh, I, I, I can I can sing you the theme song. It's <laughs> burned forever to my brain. It's like, I don't know why I've had that in my head since I've been a, a boy. Well, thank you for making my night, Josh. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know, when it goes up on YouTube, YouTube's not even going to bother flagging it either because they're just like, yeah, it's all right. <laughs> it's like close enough. <laughs> yeah. That's right. That's right. Remember, you can find the Fan to Fan podcast at www.fanpodcast.com. Facebook, just search Fan to Fan podcast. That's F A N, the number two, F A N, on Instagram at Fan to Fan podcast. Or on Twitter, at fan to fan podcast We'd love to hear from you, so send a message and let us know what you think of the show. Thanks. And now, on with the show. we got to talk about uh, the disco music for part three. If uh, the 3D gimmick, if Jason getting the mask, if that wasn't enough for you, then the music, the disco music... So memorable, like it's so it's so out of left field. It's just yes, like, what? it's like, wait, what? Yes, I I feel like there's a back room where Harold is practicing his disco moves, and he has the the perfect like going out club clothes. And Edna doesn't know this, but when he closes up the shop, he goes back there, and there's a disco ball. Like that's the scene that we were missing. I feel like that would have like brought it all together, full circle. That's right. 100%. I mean, you know, who's 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 to deny Harry Manfredini if you're wanting to you know stretch his legs a little bit when he's this is the third movie that he's done in the franchise he's like you know everyone knows the kiki mama thing you know like i need to spread the wings a little bit it's 1982 disco may be dead but not in this <laughs> film it's not I, I did find a few little pieces of trivia that i just want to throw out to you guys one the original storyline was supposed to focus on genie who yes guess i guess she learns like self-defense and then she's kind of terrorized by jason again and i guess one of the plot elements is that she ends up finding paul's corpse inside her dorm so before he took manhattan he he went to whatever college was uh Jenny was attending to school that's right <laughs> that's right uh yeah so if you never thought jason got any respect uh he would have in this version of part three. Um, but then, yeah, because of her self-defense and maybe newfound well, confidence, minute. she tracks him down and they have like a final confrontation. But Amy Steele, the actress, did not want to do it. So they pivot. Back to school, Rodney Dangerfield's son was named Jason Mellon. <laughs> <laughs> and then we could have gotten an awesome Oingo Boingo song, too. Nice. Here's here's another uh, a musical connection. I did see... In order to prevent the plot from being leaked, because, you know, I guess that's a concern, they used the fake title Crystal Japan that was uh, named after a David Bowie song. I yes. heard that they did that on a bunch of the Friday movies. Like, they would they would take a different Bowie song title, and that was always the working title. 
Uh, I don't know if they did it for all of them, but they did it for a bunch. Because if anyone was ever worried about plots being leaked for a movie... (laughs) Uh, I guess there were two novelizations for this because, you know, if if you can't just have one, why would you? You can have two. And then uh, because you are a fan of his portrayal of Jason Pete, uh, Richard Brooker, I did see he was a producer on a show that you guys may have heard of. Bill Nye, the science guy. The man was a gymnast. He was part of like a traveling circus. And he also yeah. played Jason Voorhees. Pretty amazing. By all, by all accounts, from the cast, they they thought that he was a great guy, and uh, you know, I don't think he was doing the method acting where he felt like he needed to be intimidating uh, the cast members while cameras weren't rolling. So he was British too. So on top of all of that, and there's some pretty. If you do some Google image searching, you'll find some shots of him in full Jason uh, prosthetics with a smoking pipe. So if, if you <laughs> you've know. seen some of those pictures, yeah. yeah. So if you want to see that image of, you know, seemingly like a, a very nice Richard Brooker, you know, getting along, probably, probably, you know, maybe elder statesman on, on the cast with a bunch of teenagers him walking around with a pipe being like, all right, well, who do I kill next in a very suave, cool British accent? <laughs> but no, I mean, yeah, Friday the 13th part three, it, it is when you're, when you, if, if you're watching all of these movies together on a binge, it's the first one that feels like what you expect it to be. Because obviously the first movie you're if you if you all you know about Friday the 13th is Jason Voorhees and then someone puts you in front of the first movie you're watching. You're just like, wait, what? He's not even in this. What? And you watch the second one. You're just like, oh, he's just like a little dude with a bag on his head. What? <laughs> you know, it, it, it. both of those things are very odd. And the, for the third movie, yeah, it's the first one you're watching and you're getting what you're anticipating that you're going to get from a Friday the 13th movie. That alone gives it its own little niche of why it's kind of great. And yeah, it does a lot of what the first two movies did just again, but it does switch it up a bit by just not being at the camp. You know, you're in this other location. Now you've got these outside characters of the bikers. Uh, it it does. It feels fresh and it feels really fun. And uh, it, it it's it's a great flick. When you're watching it as a as a young preteen, it's got like those moments that you just kind of get embedded in your brain of pulling himself up on the rope when he's hanging from the barn. He's kind of he lifts the mask up to show Chris who he is, and so because he knows like you know this is the girl that I attacked years ago, there, and she's like yelling out, "You can't be alive!" And he's you know the, again when you're a kid watching this stuff, like that's the stuff that you live for, like these little like moments where you're like, "Oh yeah, this is this is fantastic, it's badass." This 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 character is um you something that you want to keep coming back to, and and you don't mind at that age that yes, all the first couple of movies are very formulaic and very similar, but uh, you want that, you want more of the same uh, until you don't. That bit at the very ending with her dream, where you just see Jason up in the window with the mask off and he has that like really excited look on his face and he just comes busting through that door in broad daylight. It it hands down one of the most effective scenes in the entire franchise. It's just so creepy. He like the he looks so happy to be like, oh, I'm gonna go kill her. He probably just heard the disco music again. He probably just got really <laughs> Thank you.